Good morning, everyone. May God bless you. We're going to look at the Word of God today, and we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that's probably one of the most well-known in Christian circles. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 21. John chapter 3. Verse 1 to verse 21. And before we do that, we're going to commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And we need your truth daily as food for our souls. Father God, please grant your Holy Spirit to reveal to us the truth from your word this day as we read it and give thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 1. I hope you're all ready. Here we go. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not. How shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. May God bless the reading of his words to each and every one of you. Okay. In this well-known account, we have a conversation between Jesus and a Pharisee 
named Nicodemus. And within this conversation is possibly the most well-known sentence in the New Testament. This is, of course, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, and so on. However, there's, a far more there's far more involved in this conversation than just that one verse. Within the conversation lies a deep and meaningful message to each and every one of us. And it's this deeper message that we're going to explore today in the following sermon. First of all, I want us to look at this man, this Pharisee, Nicodemus. Now the name Nicodemus itself means victorious among his people. Victorious among his people. Nicodemus was a ruler of his people, as we're told in the very first verse of our text today. And the word ruler is the Greek word archon, which means a ruler, a chief, a commander or leader. In other words, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, a senator of sorts, a scholar and a man of authority. However, although a member of the Sanhedrin and a Pharisee, he did not fully condone their principles. He was humble enough to realise that although he was a scholar, he did not know nor understand everything. He came to Jesus, as we see in our text, in secret, under the cover of darkness and in some confusion. He recognised that by the gift of teaching of the word of God and his authority, that Jesus was one sent by God, as we see in the following verse, and that's a verse that we've already read, but we'll look at it again. John 3, verse 2. And the same came to Jesus by night, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher, come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So Nicodemus knew he realised that Jesus was someone special, that he was sent by God. However, Jesus' answer to him is most profound indeed. And we see that in the, f in the next verse, verse 3 of John 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I emphasise the words, and you can underline it in your Bible, if you wish, the words born again and see. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now the wording in the Greek is very interesting. And I always go to the original languages because sometimes in translation a lot can be lost or missed out. Now the wording in the Greek here is interesting, as I said. The words born and again are the following Greek words. First of all, the word born is the Greek word ganao, ganaho, and it means to be conceived, to be regenerated, to be made. That's interesting, isn't it? To be conceived, to be regenerated, to be made. Ganao. The next word is again. And these, these words, brothers and sisters, seem simple. But we need to understand the wording to see the depth of what Jesus is saying. Now let's look at the word again. The word again in the Greek is anothen, anothen, which means from above, from the first, from the beginning, again, from a higher place. And that means as the first man. Interesting, isn't it? 
Now the word C, S double E, C, is the Greek word Ido or Ido, which means to see, to perceive, to discern, observe or behold. And in verse 5 we have a, a more clear and distinct answer by Jesus as to his meaning. Keep those words in the back of your mind as we read verse 5 of John 3. Jesus answered, answered Nicodemus, John answered, uh, sorry, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born, there's that word again, of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Underline the words born, water, spirit and enter because they're important words. Once again, first of all, we have the same word for born, which is to be regenerated, if you remember. Ganao. But we also have a clearer explanation by Jesus to Nicodemus as to his meaning of being born again. The use of the two different mediums that Jesus talks about, water and of spirit, signify to Nicodemus that what Jesus is suggesting is something other than natural birth again. Remember Nicodemus said, can a man enter into his mother's womb again to be born? The natural birth, that of water through the mother, and the other being a rebirth by the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus explains that unless this spirit rebirth occurs, there can be no, underline no, entry into the kingdom of God. The word enter in this uh, John 3 verse 5, the word enter being the Greek word isakomai, isakomai, which means to come in as of a man or a woman coming into a city, or of Satan taking possession of the body of a person. Entrance. The kingdom, the word kingdom, being the word basilea. Basilea, and many of you may recognise that word. It means royalty, rule, realm, kingdom, domination, or the right to rule. Now, looking at all these things, Jesus is blasting away preconceptions of Nicodemus. Unless you are born of water, a natural birth, and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. This would have been a shattering revelation to Nicodemus whose very name, as we saw earlier, means victorious over his people. Now Jesus, we must understand, had just revealed to this man, Nicodemus, who to his people was a, a good man, a godly man, a member of the Sanhedrin, the elite amongst the, uh, the Jews of Israel, that it would require far more than knowledge of the Word of God or a religious lifestyle to enter the Kingdom of God. Furthermore, at this present time, he, that is Nicodemus, is not even eligible to see. He's not even able to see or to perceive, to behold or to understand the Kingdom of God unless he is born of the Spirit, as well as, as the water. As we saw from Jesus' own words in, in verse 3, I'll read it again. Jesus, that's John 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now these piercing words of Jesus to Nicodemus reveal 
what every single person in the whole world so very desperately needed to hear then and hear, need to hear now. Both to hear and also to understand. Even the most pious, religious person in this world, if they're not regenerated by the Spirit of God, a new creation, are still merely of the flesh. They're still fallen, sinful human beings doomed to the pending judgment of an angry God. What is required then is what Jesus actually came to make possible, that being the forgiveness of original sin. He did this through his precious blood shed at Calvary and the regeneration available through his victory over both sin and death in his resurrection from the dead. Without this resurrection, with, without this regeneration, sorry, or rebirth by the Spirit of God, it is simply not possible, and I emphasise not possible, to truly see or even understand the Kingdom of God. Now this would be extremely difficult for anyone to hear, let alone someone who had spent their whole life supposedly devoted to the service of God, like Nicodemus. This man had done what he thought right for his whole life. He had studied the word of God, the Tanakh, the law and the prophets and the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. He kept himself ceremonially clean so that he could minister in the temple in Jerusalem for the feasts and so on. Nevertheless, he was being told here that he was still falling short of what God required. Now you see, in his mind, in Nicodemus' mind, as with all of the then Pharisees and Sadducees and all the religious men of his day, he was pure and clean and assured of a place in God's kingdom because he was a Jew and a righteous one at that. How many people today have that same idea because they go to church every Sunday? Or they do what they think is right each day. They don't do any harm. They don't murder anyone or, or commit a crime. However, just as with absolutely everyone on the face of the earth, simple obedience to the word of God, that be doing good and being good, is simply not enough. There will always remain the insoluble problem of inherent original sin. And unless this is dealt with in the life of any person, it therefore remains impossible for anyone to stand before a holy and a righteous God without facing condemnation and eternal death. An eternal death being separation from God for eternity. Let me explain. The blood that was shed under the old or the Mosaic covenant was merely a temporary fix a temporary cleansing under this law the blood of the sacrificial animals had to be offered each and every day in order to cover the sin of a person and more blood was shed during the feast days for the covering of the sin of the people the nation the priests and the levites and so on Whereas here, Jesus, the Son of the living God, the only begotten of the Father, had come to earth to offer up to his Father, the Almighty God, his own sinful life and blood once and for all, thus making a better 
an everlasting way as we see so plainly and clearly in Hebrews chapter 10. Let's read together. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, I'll start at verse 1. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers, therefore, perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance, again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Notice, take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. Underline that. Once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That once forever sacrifice for sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I want to look at two things. There are two very vital things that will help us to understand this discussion that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And they are as follows. Number one, Jesus cleansed the temple in Jerusalem. And number two, the short account of why Jesus did not put his trust in any man. And that's found in John 2, verses 23 to 25. But we'll look at that in a moment. First of all, we're going to look at Jesus cleansing the temple. Now, there are two different accounts of Jesus cleansing or purging the temple in Jerusalem in the Gospels. The first is actually found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verse 12. This occurred, we won't read that now, but this occurred in the latter end of his ministry, prior, just prior to his um, judging and crucifixion on the cross at Calvary. Matthew 21, verse 12. The second one is found in the previous chapter to our text is found in John chapter 2 verse 13 to 22 and that is at the beginning of his ministry just prior to this encounter with Nicodemus and Jesus put no trust in any man this is the second Thing that we want to look at. Jesus put no trust in any man. Now the reason that there are two occurrences 
of the cleansing of the temple that we've just looked at. The reason there are two occurrences, I believe, is explained in the following scripture, which gives us our second point. Jesus didn't put his trust in any man. Let's read John 2, verse 23 to 25. John 2, 23 to 25. Verse 23 of John 2. Now when he, that's Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Underline those last four words. He knew what was in man. This is also the reason that Jesus says what he does to Nicodemus. And that reason being simply the problem of inherited original sin. Jesus knew that that sin stain was in every man. And it's sin which corrupts the good intentions of all mankind every time. Jesus therefore needing to cleanse or purge the temple not just once but twice. Even though the stark truth of the need of more than the blood of animals is required to permanently purify from sin came from the promised Messiah himself. To God's chosen people, Israel, this truth did not change their hearts. Jesus cleansed the temple first of all, right at the beginning of his ministry that we found that in Matthew. Uh, sorry, here in John chapter 2, right at the beginning. And yet in Matthew 21, Jesus has to do it again because all of the truth that Jesus brought didn't change their hearts and minds. To God's chosen people, Israel, it didn't change their hearts or their minds. This, of course, does not just relate to the Jewish people of Jesus' day, but to all of fallen sinful mankind, Jew or non-Jew. This is because of the problem of inherent sin. This sin stain, as we can call it, abides and controls the thoughts, the plans and acts of every man, woman and child, no matter how pious they may appear to be. This is the reason why Jesus said what he did in John 2, 23 to 25. Jesus did not commit himself to any man because he knew what was in man, that being the taint of original sin. Now the word commit in the Greek is pistewo, pistewo, and that means to have confidence in, to think to be true, and so on. To commit, Jesus did not give put his confidence in any man and he didn't think that any man to be was true because of what he saw was in every man. Sin, the same stain of sin. So then we turn back to Nicodemus. Here we have one of, if not the most, pious man of his day. As is stated, in John 3 chapter 1, he's a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. In effect, he's a prince amongst his people. He's well versed in the Mosaic law and all of the religious rites and rituals associated with the temple. Nevertheless, this supposedly righteous and godly man could not understand what Jesus was telling him that being that all 
of the righteous, pious ritual of the temple and the feasts and so on were not enough to, to gain sorry, a close and personal relationship with God, let alone being able to see or understand his kingdom. Something far more permanent would be required for such a relationship. That something was death and rebirth. Resurrection, if you like. And this is exactly what being born again actually means. The phrase born again is made up of two Greek words, as we saw earlier. I'll restate them. Again, if you can't remember, the word born is ganao, which means to procreate, to regenerate, to be born, to conceive, or to be conceived. And the word again is anothen, which means from above, anew, again, from the beginning. In other words, it is to become a new creation as so excellently and succinctly put by the Apostle Paul in the, the next two verses that I want us to read. The first is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking here. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things, all things are become new. And secondly, Galatians chapter 6 verse 15. Galatians chapter 6 verse 15. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Therefore, a man being born anew, born from above, born again, would no longer be burdened by the sin stain of original sin. It would rather be a life born afresh, born anew, born from above by the Holy Spirit and not that of the flesh. This is exactly what Jesus was saying, trying to teach Nicodemus. And this is what every man, woman and child need urgently to hear and to understand, not just in Jesus' day, but in our day today. Most people, if honest, when asked, would like to think that when they die they will go to heaven. However, Jesus here presents to everyone, not just to Nicodemus, the stark and unvarnished truth. That truth being that unless we are born again of the Spirit of God through faith in Christ Jesus and his unfinished work at Calvary, sorry, and his finished work at Calvary. There is absolutely no way we would ever be able to see or to understand the kingdom of God, let alone to enter it. The simple reason being that we are all tainted, we are all contaminated by the stain of original sin. We are merely born of the flesh. Jesus' words in our text to this seemingly godly man, Nicodemus, are also Jesus' words to you today. If you've not been born again, in other words, been convicted of your sin before a holy God, repented of that sin and submitted to the Lordship of Christ Jesus, if you've done all this, you will have been regenerated, born anew, born from above. You have become a new creation. A new creation, as the Apostle puts it in 2 
Corinthians 5.17. We'll read it again and underline the word creature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I want you to underline that word creature in your Bible because the word creature here translated for us in the King James in the English is actually the Greek word katisis, katisis, which means original formation. By implication, the thing literally or figuratively, a building, a creation, a creature, ordinance. Simply put, it means that you are made a new creature, a new species, a fresh creation of God with no stain of original sin. Just as the first man was made before the fall, Adam, God created Adam. He formed him from the dust of the ground and he breathed into him the Spirit of God, life everlasting. Before the fall, he was without sin at that point. And you can be just like that. And that's what being born again means. Born from above, a new creature. Simply put, it means that you're a new species, a fresh creation of God with no stain of original sin, just like the first man, Adam, before the fall. If you've ever experienced this change, if you've never, sorry, experienced this change, you are simply not born again. And as a result, you will not be able to enter, let alone see the kingdom of God. However, if you truly want to go to heaven, to be with God, to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, where he is, to enter into the kingdom of God, then Jesus' words to Nicodemus are the words which you must take to heart and to act upon, because they apply to all of us, not just to Nicodemus. The message is so simple. You must be born again. Praise God. I trust that you'll take this message to heart if you've not been convicted of your sin, if you've not repented of that sin and called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life, then you need to do just that. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to be with him, then you must be born again. I commit this message to you and I hope that it blesses you. And until the next time, may God richly bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.